We started a new series called The Summer of Divine Encounters. Can somebody say that? A Summer of Divine Encounters. And so we start a series, and what we're doing is we're ramping up from today all the way to our conference in September, so September the 18th through the 22nd, and we're going to, I believe, we're just going to begin to just move right into a move of God all the way through the summer and into the fall, amen? And so we're expecting God to do amazing things. So in the first service, we talked about, and this is going to be our theme verse for the month and for the, for the season, and that is Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 4 where Moses saw a burning bush and he said, I will now turn aside. I'm going to stop what I'm doing and I'm going to go see what's going on with this burning bush. And when the Lord saw, the scripture says, that he turned aside. Sometimes you have to take time. Divine encounters take time. Has anyone ever had a divine encounter? Are you saved? Do you have Jesus in your heart? Then you've had a divine encounter. Now, let me try that again. How many have had a divine encounter? Amen. And so when you have a divine encounter, it takes time. And so Moses turned aside from what he was doing, and he went to the burning bush. And out of the burning bush, when God saw that he took the time for a divine encounter, he said to him, and this is a proof that God's Italian. Any Italians in the room? Any Italians in the room? He said, Moses, Moses. God speaks in Italian. You know that. He's like the Godfather, right? I'm going to give you an offer you can't refuse. And so he said it to Abraham. He said, Abraham, Abraham. He said it to Jacob, Jacob, Jacob. He said it to Ma Martha, Martha. Yeah, you know, different times in Scripture, nine times in Scripture, God repeats and says a double phrase. And so in this Scripture in Exodus 3, this is the first service I'm giving the trailer. He said, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here am I. And that's where we ended. Because there's a certain point where you get into the presence of God and you say, present. I am present in your presence. Here am I. I don't want to be found anywhere else. And God's looking. He's saying, Moses, but he calls you by name. And he says, he identifies you. And in that place, you say, yep. I'm here for the divine encounter. I'm here for the summer of divine encounters. And so we're building and we're ramping up until the fall. I'm going to show you a, a, our, our clip now. How many want a sneak peek of what's going to happen? We have Pastor William McDowell. We have Chris Durso. Oh, it's getting closer. That means it's something. It's coming. There must be a revival on the horizon. It means there must be an outpouring on the horizon. See, when you find yourself in a moment where your current situation does not match with the word you got, realize that you are about to experience revival. You are about to experience change. You are about to experience a shift. Give me the man that changed history. Give me the name that's above all names. Give me the God that's above all the earth. Give me the one that still has the power to change times and seasons. That's my champion. I said, what you're about to look into and see, when you get that revelation, you're not going to be able to just mosey on along like you used to, but you're moving into a new era of resurrection power. Amen. And you can see we're going to have a lot of friends here and more are coming. It's going to be a powerful time, but we're not waiting for September. We're starting right now, can somebody get your finger up and say, starting now, God's moving. And so we're, we're looking at this whole concept of divine encounters, and this is part two. And the first service, I talked about we need a divine encounter. Can somebody say that? We need, a, how many know that America needs a divine encounter? The church needs a divine encounter. Don't get me preaching up here. I'm just talking for a minute. But we need a divine encounter. We need to understand that we need a divine encounter. Pastor Alexander, do you have a gift for me? Because I have a gift for everybody at the end of the service. In the first service, I gave everybody a gift. Has anyone ever come out of dinner? You were maybe going to a, a nice place, and you came out of dinner, and you were full. How many ate a lot of food on July 4th? 
We're going to have a deliverance line at the end of the service here. But you, 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 you came out of the dinner, and you were full, but you were walking by this ice cream shop, and there was this smell of a waffle cone that came out. It wafted into your nostrils. You weren't even thinking about ice cream. You were minding your own business. And the waffle cone, they just cooked a fresh waffle cone and spun it and made it into a cone and, or a bowl. And you're sitting there going, I need a waffle cone. You weren't even, you were, you were, you were headed in a different direction. You know what I'm saying? You're going back to the car, go back to the house, and you were going to chill, but you got a fragrance of a waffle cone, and all of a sudden, this revelation dropped on, I need a waffle cone, and then about 30 seconds later, you find yourself in line, and you're like, yes, but, uh, um, 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 uh, cookies and cream. Does anyone like cookies and cream in here? Now, how many, on your count of three, I want you to say your favorite flavor. One, two, three. I heard of cookies and cream. One thing that's kind of cool is my dad was very close friends with the man who invented cookies and cream ice cream. And he was with Dryers and Edie's. And uh, he actually had a million-dollar tongue. His tongue was insured for a million dollars. He was on Oprah one time. She did a blind test on her show, and she had seven different vanillas, and he was blindfolded. And he went, Briars, Huggin' Doss. And he went down the line, and he knew every single vanilla flavor and brand. He was a million-dollar tongue. He invented 17 different flavors, and the most famous was cookies and cream. He was sitting there one day with some vanilla, and he had an Oreo, and a revelation came from heaven. How many know cookies and cream is a revelation? And he crumpled it in, and he stirred it in. He said, we have a new flavor, cookies and cream. And so he invented it, and it was such a good thing because my dad was pastoring at the time. And every year in December, he would get a royalty check for inventing cookies and cream. And what he would do was he would tithe. Can somebody say tithe? On his royalty check, and when he tithed on his royalty check, that just pushed the finance of the church over the top every December. And so cookies and cream. John Harrison, we love you. He's in heaven with my dad right now. But... You're sitting there and you're ordering this. Why? Because you had the smell of waffle cones enter into your nostrils. And by the way, I have at the, on the way out, at the tables on the way out, I have a waffle cone for every single person in this room. As a gift to you, somebody said, did you provide the ice cream? I said, no, just the cone. I can't, I don't know, you all said all the flavors. I can't keep up with you. You provide the fire, and I'll provide the ice cream. You know, you sit there and just, so, so, but, but there's something about getting a, an, a desire where you say, I need a divine encounter. I need a waffle cone. I need ice cream. In this summer, I believe God is going to put a desire an appetite, a hunger, can I talk to somebody here, and a thirst for his presence, for revival, for an awakening, for a move of his spirit like we've never seen before. Can somebody say, I'm pressing through to get to you? Somebody say, when you have a need, I need a divine encounter. When you have a need, you press through. You show up. There's a passion inside of you. If you have a need and you're hungry, come on, somebody, and you're feeling like some barbecue, you run over to Rudy's or Miller's, or you just make some for yourself, but you have a need. And I just believe that God wants to drop that need inside of his church. We need a mighty move of God. We need to see the power of God. We need a healing in our bodies, in our hearts, in our minds. Can I talk to somebody up in here? And so let me define it. 
the, the, the divine encounter real quick, and I'm going to show you a scripture from Psalm 73, part 2. This is called orientation. Can somebody say orientation? Okay, so let's define uh, the, the, the divine encounter. You ready? You get your phones out or notes out. A divine encounter, number one, is a real, genuine, authentic experience with God that sticks with you for a lifetime. Ooh, this is good stuff. This is not just a moment that you walk out and you forget about. This thing sticks. It changes you. Watch the next one. Divine encounter also is a, when a natural, earthly, ordinary man meets with a supernatural, heavenly, extraordinary God. Is that good right there? A divine encounter also, watch this one. Divine encounter is when you experience God and everything changes. You get into his presence and everything changes. David said in Psalm 16 and verse 11, in your presence there's fullness. Somebody say fullness. There's fullness of joy. There's a, a joy that is beyond speech. It's full of glory. It's a joy where weeping has endured for a night, but it's a joy that comes in the morning. It's a joy that is your strength. Can I talk to somebody up in here? And you experience God and everything changes. You might have come in depressed, but you come out with joy. You might have come in heavy, come on somebody, and in weeping and in mourning, but all of a sudden you come out with dancing, and you can't help yourself. You, you have to, you, there's joy that comes, and laughter comes to you, and so you're in that moment where you came in one way, but you go out another. Like in Ezekiel's temple, they entered in one gate, but they went out another gate when they came to the temple of God. They could not go back the way they came in, because of what they experienced in his presence. How many have experienced his presence before and everything changed? A divine encounter also, watch this, is when God orchestrates, and this is what I'm talking about today. When God orchestrates a moment that orients you with his mind, his heart, mind, and plan for a person, a people, a place, or a situation. When God orchestrates a moment where he orients you, he brings you into disclosure. He brings you into a moment of revelation and everything changes. Can I talk to somebody up in here? So I want to read Psalm 73 and just walk through it. Psalm 73, if you're taking amazing notes, which I see some are, Psalm 73 is written by a man named Asaph. Can somebody say Asaph? Asaph was a man who was in a part of David's tabernacle. In the scriptures, you realize that there were different temples and different tabernacles for different seasons. And so the first tabernacle that you see in scripture, of course, is in the garden. But after the garden of Eden, all of a sudden, God came to Moses at Mount Sinai. And he not only gave him the Ten Commandments, but he gave him the blueprint and the plan for the tabernacle that was in the wilderness. And with the tabernacle, there was furniture, there was an altar, and it was all a prefiguring. It was, it was a picture. It was a type and a shadow of what the work of Jesus would be in the New Testament. But we're in the Old Testament, and so it was an altar. And in the altar, they would sacrifice bulls and rams and lambs, etc., for their sins, for their peace offerings, for different offerings they would sacrifice. And then there was the laver, and the laver was a place that represented salvation and then water baptism, and they would wash their hands and be clean of the blood so that they could go into the holy place, because in the holy place there was the candlestick, there was the table of showbread, and there was the altar of incense. The altar of incense represented prayer. Prayer. The candlestick represented different revelation truths that lit up that room. And then there also was the altar of uh, the table of showbread, which represented an Old Testament version of communion. And then there was one more place, and it was the most holy place. And in the most holy place, there was the Ark of the Covenant. It was where the glory of the Lord was. And this was the tabernacle that was called Moses. 
But there was a season during the days of Eli when they misused the ark of God's presence and they tried to use it for war and they lost the ark to the Philistines. And when they lost the ark to the Philistines, they took the ark, the Philistines took the ark and put it in the temple of Dagon, which was their God. And when they put it before Dagon in the morning, Dagon's statue was bowing down before the ark of God. And so the Philistines didn't know what to do with it, so they just put it on a cart and they rolled it back. And David got it. And David had to learn how to use it because Uzzah died. But they had to learn how to take the ark, and the ark was, had to be rested on the shoulders of the priest. The government rests upon the shoulders, and they took it. And as he took it back, the Scripture says that every six steps he sacrificed bulls. Every six is the number of man. It's the number of the flesh. I'm just giving you background here. And, and here you are in this place, every six steps. One, two, three, four, five, six. Kill the bull. One, two, three, four, five, six. Kill another bull. One, you get what I'm saying? All the way back to Jerusalem. Do you know how long that journey took? And by the time they got to the city, the scripture says that David took off his priestly robes because he was so excited because I went to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole from me. And he got into the city, and the scripture says David began to dance. He was dancing, and his wife Michael was looking from the balcony and saying, How darest a king of Israel unclothe himself before the maidens? What he was doing was taking off his kingly robes, and he was dancing before the Lord. And he looked at that woman, and he said, Girl, cayete por favor. Next time, I'm going to be even more undignified than this. David couldn't help himself. He brought the presence of the Lord back to Jerusalem, back to the place. And so there was a certain moment, and this is where we get into Psalm 73. There was a certain moment when David brought back the ark. Bring him back the ark. And he built a tent, and he put the ark in the tent, and he started a worship service that went, watch this, 365 days a year, 24 hours, seven days a week. Worship, worship. He had to get worshipers, chief musicians, singers, <laughs> musicians, 24-7. You go from 2 to 3 a.m., and then you go from 3 to 4 a.m., and then you go from 4 to 5 a.m. And there was always this fresh worship going on all the time. At the same time, whew, this was Mount Zion. There was a tent and an ark. At the same time, in Mount Gerizim, Moses' tabernacle was still going through the motions. And they had all of the pieces of the furniture except one. And so this is church without the presence, sacrificing bulls, washing in the labor, trimming the wicks of the candles and putting oil in the candlestick, putting altar bread on the, on the table of showbread, uh, doing the incense, taking the fire from the altar to the altar of incense and putting incense to the Lord, but nothing. This is going through the motions of religiosity and at the same time one place no furniture but the ark the other place all the furniture all the the, the, the robes and the curtains and the the, the the religiosity was going on but no presence two churches one with the presence one without the presence one looks like a church acts like a church no presence. One is just a tent. It doesn't make no sense. They don't have a suit on. He's got tennis shoes on. Ooh, somebody's so white. But there's presence. 
And so you arrive at Psalm 73, and there is this man named Asaph. Can somebody say Asaph? Asaph means gatherer. Asaph means collector. Asaph, watch this, means one who gathers the harvest. But it's not just gather. It means to gather and to store. One who knows how to create a storehouse for what is being gathered. Because if you just pick the fruit and you don't know where to put it and what to do with it, then guess what's going to happen? It's going to rot. Animals are going to come. Thieves are going to come. But ASAP, there's a wisdom that God gives for the harvest. It's like Joseph. Can somebody say Joseph? And so you look at Asaph and you realize that he is this, he's the author of 12 Psalms. 12 is the number of government. There was a governmental apostolic Old Testament anointing on him. He wrote Psalms 50 and then 73 through 82. He was the son of, the scripture says, Barakiah. And Barakiah means Yahweh blesses. He's Yahweh blesses. And so you realize in the scripture that they were a part of the Levites. Levi means joined. And so here you have Asaph, son of Barakiah, who was a Levite. And of the Levites, they were part of the, the Gerishon, the Gerishonites. And the Gerishonites were the ones in Moses' tabernacle who took care of all the curtains that were around the outer court. They were the ones who took care of the outer court. And it's amazing because this is Moses' tabernacle, and now we have their generations in David's tabernacle. And then all of a sudden you realize that in the future, in, in, after they came out of Babylon, there was a group of people called the sons of Asaph. And when they came out of Babylon with Ezra, there were 128 sons, grandsons, great-grandsons of this man's name Asaph, whom the scripture says they were musicians and singers and songwriters in the new temple. And so here you have these generations where Moses' tabernacle, David's tabernacle, Asaph was even uh, called a seer in Solomon's temple, and then you have the new tabernacle foundation being laid. So here you have this multi-generational from Levi all the way to the end of the Old Testament. You have this family. And in the middle of the family, you have this man named Asaph. Asaph was a friend of David. Asaph was well known. He was what you call a chief musician. In today's lingo, he would be a music director. He'd be the one who's leading the band. David would come and say, here's a song, Asaph. And Asaph would be sitting on the keys, and he'd look and say, all right, David. And he'd begin to sing, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. And he began to lead the, the orchestra and the choir. And they began to sing the song of the Lord. And Asaph wasn't just one who sang David's songs. He sang his own song. I want you to catch this. It's one thing, and it's a good thing, to sing the songs of others. But there's another thing. When you begin to sing your song, when you begin to give God your worship, when you begin to take your story and you put it into a worship set, God, I worship you because you delivered me and you healed me and you restored me and you renewed me and you resurrected me and so I'm going to worship you through every season of time this is uh, my worship see there's a certain point where we get off the song that we're singing and all of a sudden we begin to freestyle and we begin to sing our song God I praise you I love you. 
Come on, somebody, just lift up your hands and just right now in this room, just tell the Lord, I, I love you. You've been so good to me. You took me out of the pit. You took me out of darkness. I once was blind, but now I see. I worship you. I can't help myself. I must worship because you have brought me a mighty long way. Can somebody say, praise the Lord. Let everything that hath breath. Praise the Lord. And so Asaph is singing his song. And you arrive at 73, and in verse 1, he starts off, and it sounds good, right? This is a bop. This is a jam right here. Music's playing. It got a beat to it, a little rhythm to it. Ooh, this is a melody. The intro sounds good. Oh, yeah. Let's do this. A song of Asaph. Asaph, you must have got... Oh my gosh, some, some revelation here. You got, you got a little flow. This is a vibe. And they play the intro, and then he starts off on the first line. Truly, verse 1, God is good to Israel. <laughs> Everybody wave your hands in the air. We got to give God his props. Truly, ha, God is good to Israel. Can somebody say God is good to Israel? See, there's a certain point where he's speaking over the nation and saying, God, you have been good, and I'm declaring it in this place. And you're sitting there going, that's a, that's a lyric right there. Ooh, God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. Does that sound good so far? And then you go to verse 2, and it changes. But as for me, you're good to them. But as for me, it's about to get personal up in here. Can somebody say, as for me? See, I can look at Pastor Patrick, and he's up there, and he's, you know, he's got his window pane shirt on, he's preaching, and he's smiling, and he's loving Jesus. He must have had a perfect life. I heard, he say, I heard they said he's eight-generation ministry. He's pastored in different places and preaches all over the place. He must have, my gosh. Uh-uh. There's a price. <laughs> Bishop Joel Brooks, I was with him. I'm going to be with him in Kalamazoo in a minute and uh, this week. And uh, he was uh, preaching and he said, somebody came up to him and said, I want you to teach me how to do ministry. And he sat back and he thought about it for a minute. He's like, well, I could teach them how to preach. I could teach them how to prophesy. I could teach them how to teach could teach them all the mechanics, the intros, the outros, the vocal arrangements. How to say certain things, God. But if I teach people how to do ministry without showing them my intimacy, I'm doing them a disservice. Oh, somebody's alive up in here. And so there's a certain point where, as for me, there's a certain point where there's a price that has been paid. There's a certain point where you got to understand that this revelation that I got didn't come easy. It came through the school of hard knocks. It came through challenge. It came through fire. It came through flood. It came through people riding over me. I didn't just get this because I just woke up and I'm God's special child. You're his favorite. But if you're his favorite, guess what's going to happen? You're going to go through a few things. Because God's going to give you a testimony. And what does the old preacher used to say? You can't have a testimony without going through a... And so Asaph is sitting here going, but as for me. And he begins to juxtapose, compare and contrast his life with the life of the wicked. And I'm not going to get into all these verses, but verses 3 through 15, you can read it on your own. He's sitting there. He's like, okay, wait a second, God. I love you. They hate you. I praise you. They curse you. I thank you. And they turn their backs to you. And this doesn't make sense because they are rich they drive bentley's i'm just bringing in our vernacular here 
They live in mansions. They ride in their own planes. And they're cursing you. They're having, they're having wars between Kendrick and Drake, and they're riding in their own planes. Diss tracks going back and forth. And then they look at me, and they're trying to diss me because I follow you and look at me. I don't have none of that. And if you look at the two stories, it would look like they're the ones who were blessed. And it'll look like I'm the one who was cursed. And so he writes this song. And sometimes, I, you know, Pastor Haley, we got to write a song like this. You know, we're sitting up here going, you know, our God reigns. You know, and so I'm desperate for you. What about, what about writing a song like, God, I'm not happy. I'm kind of mad right now. I'm not feeling it, God. And you're sitting there. Everybody wave your hands in the air. And I'm putting my hands down. And you're just sitting there. It's real talk. As for me language. Come on. And you're sitting there telling your story. My story has not been that good. And he gets to verse 16. And I want to show you this because I'm going to show you two verses. And then God's going to do something mighty in this room. In verse 16, he said, when I thought about all of this, huh, when I thought how to understand this, watch this, it was too painful for me. Somebody say pain. No pain. Pain, I wrote down a definition, is an unpleasant emotional experience. It is a distressing feeling caused by intense or damaging stimuli. Pain will cause you to withdraw. Pain will give you anxiety. Pain will cause you to enter into depression. Pain will cause your life to freeze in a moment and you're stuck there. And you can't do anything about it. Pain will put a limitation on you. Not just from others, but limitations you put on yourself. Pain. You can mark a moment in your life where you experience pain. If I sat down and interviewed you, you could probably tell me the day, if not the hour, when pain came into your life, when I was seven, I was victimized. When I was 11, come on somebody, I, they talked about me and my family rejected me. When I was, and you sit there and you walk through pain. Pain marks our lives. And here is Asaph explaining a painful moment. Not just a moment, a painful season. A painful moment turns into a painful season. And a painful season all of a sudden becomes a way of life. Well, all of a sudden you look through the eyes of pain. You look through the glasses of pain. You think your thoughts through your pain. You make your decisions through your pain. <laughs> you choose relationships through your pain. You spend your money through your pain. Can I talk to somebody up in here? You treat people the way you treat them through your pain. You drive your car on the road through your pain. And everything is through the window pain. The window called pain. Everything is through pain. And here's Asaph. And he's like, whew. This is a song. Can you imagine a song? Let's just call the song Pastor Haley Pain. I'm coming to the house of God, but I'm not feeling it. I'm sitting among God's people, and I'm not liking them. I'm listening to the preacher up there, but every preacher's hurt me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on, let's real talk here. We could sit here right now and just have everyone close your eyes and think of the most painful moment that ever happened in your life 
and people will start crying. You, you, pain evokes emotion. And here, in the middle of the worship song, it seems so inappropriate. He's sitting here describing his pain. I believe that the most powerful worship that you could bring to the Lord is to praise him through your pain. The author of the Hebrews called it the sacrifice of praise. Lifting my hands as the evening sacrifice, even when I don't feel like it, I'm going to praise him. Ha, even when it, I'm just, I'm not with it right now, I'm going to stop and I'm going to press through and I'm going to thank him. Remember that song back in the day? Hallelujah, anyhow. Well, you sit there and you bring a hallelujah. You raise a hallelujah in the middle of your story, in the middle of your mess, in the middle of your deep press, in the middle of your pain. You lift up your hands and you praise his holy name. You can't help yourself. You got to give him glory. Even in your story, no matter how gory, you say hallelujah anyhow. Can somebody say hallelujah anyhow? Divine encounter, divine encounter, divine encounter, divine, divine encounter. It's time to get honest. It's time, time, time to come honestly. We don't have to put on a show. Somehow church, back in the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, got a little showy. And we became entertainment. And we're entertaining the wrong ones. The only entertaining that needs to happen is we entertain his presence. I love Asaph because he's honest. He's got the pedigree. He's got the relationship. He's friends with David. He's got the pedigree. He comes from the family. And he has also a prodigy that goes into the future. And it's amazing. But he takes all that stuff off. It's like the Apostle Paul. If anyone has the opportunity to brag, he told the church in Philippi, I do. I was born a Benjamite. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I sat at the feet of Gamaliel. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews, a scribe of scribes, a Pharisee of Pharisees. Concerning the law, I was blameless. I got a story to tell, but I'm going to shed it all off. And I'm going to get honest. Brother Will, can you come here? Um, who else can I use? Um, Brother Tom, can you come here? Just come stand up here. I'll show you something. Just stand. Stand right here and just face that way. Yeah, just face that way. And just come over here. And just face him. Face him just straight across. Right there. That's good. Okay. I'll tell you who these guys are in a moment. Let's read, look at 16 again. Watch this. When I thought... To understand, somebody say understand. This, it was too painful for me. There's something, certain things that happen to us that are beyond our understanding. We cannot articulate it. We can praise about it, but we just can't get it out. It's so painful to bring it up. To bring up the pain to bring up the memory. When I thought to understand, somebody say understand. It was too painful for me. But here's the verse, watch this, verse 17. It's so powerful. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then 
I understood their end. These guys are the pillars. And lift it. This is the sanctuary. Now you guys just chill for a minute. You'll be there for about another 45 minutes. Here's the revelation. When I'm out here on my own, I'll never understand my pain. But when I get under a divine encounter, when I get into the sanctuary, I have an aha moment. Clarity comes. Out here, pain. Under here, clarity. Here's the definition. Then I understood. Out here, I did not understand. But when I stand under, I understand. Somebody's going to catch us in a minute. When I stand under, I understand. Thank you, guys. Let's give them a hand. Amen. Amen. They both deserve a Grammy Award, Oscars for both of you. Now you can put that on your resume. I was a pillar in the house of God. I want you to catch this. You can start playing. Just sustain something. Let me just think something. B flat. I just love when preachers say that. Just give me B flat. But don't be flat. And don't see flat. Okay, forget that. Catch this. God wants to bring you into a place of divine encounter where you know where you need to go. Over the summer, know where you need to go. It was when I went into the sanctuary. Woo! When I stood under. See, there's your, there's your, there's your definition. You write this down for your notes for the week. Understand. Oh, understand. To understand is to stand under. Outside, nothing. Outside, Cycles. Outside, maintenance mode. Outside, it's just going to continue. But inside, understand. Stand under, understand. Stand under, understand. Somebody stand under, understand. Somebody stand under, understand. There's a certain point where all of a sudden, Clarity comes. And you read the rest of that chapter and his song changes. And all of a sudden, before Beauty and the Beast, it was Beauty and the Beast. He's sitting here looking, when I behold you, I'm like a beast. When I behold your beauty, I'm like a beast. But then he starts going. He starts saying, whom have I in heaven but you? And there's none on earth that I desire besides you. My heart and my flesh, they fail. Verse 26 but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Verse 28, as for me, it is good for me to draw near to the Lord. As for me, I was in pain, but I got a testimony, and it's turned into a song. And my song is this, it is good for me to draw near to God. Somebody say divine encounter. Divine encounters change everything. Whoo! Somebody lift up your hands. Now, would you come? Would you come, oh God, into Karis Church? Would you move among us? We need a divine encounter. We need you. 
We need your presence. We need your glory. Ooh, Jehovah Rapha, we need your healing. Jehovah Jireh, we need your provision. Jehovah Shalom, we need your peace. Would you come, 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 come? Ven, 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 ven. Would you come, 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 come? Would you come into this place? Somebody can join me right now and just tell the Lord, would you come? Would you come into my house? Would you come into my marriage? Would you come and meet my children? Would you come whoo, into our finances, oh God? Would you come? We need a divine encounter. I need a divine encounter in my body, oh God. Would you come into every cell of my being, oh God? Whoo, I need a divine encounter. Would you give me a vision, oh God? Van, 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 would you come, come, come? Would you come and give me guidance and instruction? Would you lead me in the path everlasting? Woo. Would you give me a prophetic vision so I will not perish, oh God? Woo. Would you come, come, come? Would you come, come, come? Woo. God, would you come? Come on, somebody invite him in today. Oh, invite the presence of the Lord afresh into your life. Would you come into my mind? Woo, come onto my phone. Come onto my laptop. Come onto my iPad. Everything I put my hands to do. Would you come into my career? Woo, would you come? Would you come? Would you come into the schools in this region? Come, come, come. Would you come into Colleen, oh God? Come, come, come. Would you come into Harker Heights? Come, come, come. Woo! Nolanville, Copper's Cove, would you come, come, come? Over to Kempner, all the way to Temple and Belton, come, come, come. Woo! Would you come, Lord? I am a temple of your Holy Spirit, and I want to encounter you. Come, come, come. Come, come, come. Come, come, come. We turn aside right now to see what is happening, to see the bush that is on fire but not being consumed. You've sent an invitation. Woo, there's a holy invitation. Woo. There's a holy invitation in this season. Come, come, come. I was thinking about this. We're looking for a divine encounter while at the same time God is looking for a you encounter. More than you want it, He wants it. He wants to be with you. Come, come, come. Come, come, come. It's the song of song of Solomon. Come, come, come. Come, 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 come. Arise, my fair one, and come away. Woo! Says the bridegroom to the bride. Arise, my fair one, and come away. Come, come, come. I'm going to close the service so you can get your cone, 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 cone. I'm giving this to you so you can get a, a waft. You know something? People took this in the first service. They didn't even get out the lobby. It was cookie monsters. I need some butter pecan. Just lift your hands. I'm going to pray for you. Ooh, there it is. Holy Spirit's here right now. I love his name Jehovah because it means 
the becoming one. He becomes what you need when you need it. Isn't that a powerful name? Lord, I thank you for divine encounters being released in this house. <laughs> Pastor Nick said, we don't even have to stop after the conference. We'll just keep going. I was like, that's a good idea. So Lord, we just open up our lives. We open up our hearts. And we say, come. <laughs>